Hello everyone, Christo here from Master One Things. Today we have the honor to have uh, Dr. Alan Green as our guest. Alan has uh, his own medical practice in uh, New York, which uh, focuses on uh, longevity. He is one of the important longevity leaders who has made a big contribution to the field and uh, especially regarding the longevity compound rapamycin. In today's podcast, we are going to talk about uh, rapamycin and increase our knowledge around it. Dr. Alan Green, welcome to the show. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. A good way of uh, starting this uh, conversation is to look uh, how you got interested in the longevity field. How did your longevity journey start? Uh, I was, in, I basically, I had zero interest in longevity whatsoever. I had never given longevity a single thought. My dad lived to like 92. My like here, you know, grandparents on his side lived to the 90s. I just wasn't thinking about it. I wasn't worried about it. And I and also as a physician, I knew absolutely nothing about it. I was a pathologist. Medicine doesn't study aging. Medicine doesn't think aging is a thing. Medicine doesn't include aging. And it was uh, it's like an example of looking back. I worked for 10 years as a Nassau County Medical Examiner. I never wrote on a death certificate, cause of death, aging. That would have been kicked back immediately. It's like, like nobody dies of aging. So I just never thought about aging whatsoever. What I did think about is that at the time in 2015, uh, <clears throat> by like then, I had sort of like noticed, I was like 71, so I had noticed I was declining in my health very, very rapidly. I sort of like basically calculated that at that rate of like this, uh, this descent, I was getting like, you know, my contact with the earth <laughs> in less than five years. I was on like, I, I, I don't know, it was like, like a crash, like, you know, I didn't think, I, mean, I didn't, at that point, I did not, I thought, I was not going to make it to age 75. I definitely did not think that. And now I was wondering, what's going on? And, for, and I came to, I, I didn't have any specific things and so forth so on. I thought, I must be suffering from aging. That was my, that was my assumption, that for some reason, I was just suffering from aging very fast. And that's why I was like going downhill. It's like, uh, uh, well, then, like, uh, my reaction was that the kind of reaction that any pathologist would have, would have if I'm going to have this disease, I want to know something about it. I want to have some sort of, like, understanding of what this thing is. So I look at my medical textbooks, and I'm just absolutely blown away. Because up until then, whenever I had anything, and I was like consulting with them all the time, because I was like working as a pathologist and so forth and so on, doing like, you know, consultations, reviews and stuff. I would look at the medical textbooks, and the medical textbooks have a wonderful description discussion about everything. So I was like very, very much into like medical textbooks and medical literature. Well, now I look at my medical textbooks. There's nothing there about aging. I'm just blown away. I'm looking in the index. I'm looking in the table of contents. I'm like, it's like, how can aging not be in the I In other words, I never realized until I looked for it that aging was not even in the, in the sort of like index. Uh, so, so then I decided to sort of like start looking at it. The first things I come up was like, Complete nonsense, but then I so like, uh, but then I came across like Black Escaloni. Now Black Escaloni had a very very good idea, an extraordinary idea, starting in two thousand and six, that mTOR was driving aging, and mTOR was driving aging and age related diseases. 
and you could cheat mTOR by taking rapamycin, which lowered mTOR. So at that point, uh, after studying, so I simply like studied all of Blagascoli's papers. I like that every sort of paper that he had, I like went through all the thousand references he had. I knew like everything Blagascoli had said about anything. And uh, he was very, very, very good at very good references. It was extraordinary that he came up with this concept in 2006. Was, I mean, there was just so extraordinary little weird, little to indicate what he was saying that rapamycin, that, that mTOR was driving aging and all these age-related diseases. Since, I mean, that was even before the 2009 study, which is the first study that showed aging like rapamycin reduced uh, rapamycin increased lifespan in mice. So it was before that study. It was like before anything. And he said in 2006, and I, aging is being caused by mTOR. <laughs> yeah. And basically, at this point, the only fundamental thing that I agree with like Black is really on is he said mTOR was a quasi-program. Which was sort of like going along with the existing theory that programmed aging was impossible. So he said, which is, and it's kind of like, he actually believed that, but it's kind of a bit good that he said that. But of course, if he had said that in his plan that aging was a real program, that, 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 that mTOR was a real program, it would have been dead on arrival. People would have just rejected it outright. But when he said it was a quasi program, people could accept, people in the world of biology could accept that. It wasn't, in other words, it didn't go outside the walls of biology, which said there was, could be, there could never be a, 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 an aging program that was an intentional aging program. Anyway, so, so rapamycin, so mTOR is really a real aging program. It's not any kind of a quasi program, it's intentional, it's for the specific purpose of shortening people's lifespan, which has, in a, as a complicated mathematical way, a benefit. The benefit is sort of like, so, but anyway, that's how I got into it. So I got into it because of that. Now, in the sort of like January of 2006, I decided to start the rapamycin. I calculated, I calculated that six milligrams once a week would be a good dose. And it turned out that was a real good dose because that's the dose that most of my patients use. That's what I use with most of my patients. Uh, six milligrams once a week turns out to be a real good dose. So uh, I like started taking that in you know, January. And by like, we get by the end of like, uh, the spring, but like you know, like May and June and July, I'm just blown away. I can't believe how great I'm doing. I'm feeling fantastic. I'm feeling like you know, I was like ten years longer. I have sort of like no symptoms, like you know, whatsoever, of what I was concerned about. Uh, I'm like you know, I'm just feeling really great. Also, I noticed. It's nice and sort of like feeling really great as far as like, you know, cardiac activity. Like, in other words, that was the thing that was bothering me. I basically, I was having, you know, like a, a marked degree of exertion walking up hills, things like that. I was, uh, so I did have, so that completely disappeared. Uh, and, and the other thing I noticed is, Suddenly, I could be any way I wanted to be. <laughs> it's, like, it's like my whole life, I'd be like, you know, I was trying to sub 510. So I'm trying to stay like 175. But by basically fighting a battle to go 185, 190, when I got to 200, I like never weighed myself and I never wore any pants. I just would wear joggers because <laughs> I wasn't going I wasn't to buy bigger pants. So that was five years. I just only wore joggers, and I never weighed myself. But anyway, as soon as I started the rapamycin, I realized I could like it was like real easy to lose weight because I uh, I was just amazed. It was like I mean it was still sort of like a, like a little hard, 
But I was like, it was like no longer a problem. I, and I just realized I could like dial in any way I wanted to do. <laughs> I, could, I could like decide you want to be like 160, 150, 145. I could be typically be any way I wanted to be. And it's like and I never had, and not only that, there wasn't any like, there wasn't any pressure to like gain weight. Like I could feel my body wasn't trying because up until then, for like, like now, I was like, you know, uh, early 70s. So I like 50 years of this, like, you know, the feeling that my body is always trying, to, especially the last tw 20 years, like my body is always trying to put on weight. And it's a constant battle to, uh, to not put on weight. Suddenly, it was not a battle at all. It was like total surrender. You know, my body is total surrender. Whatever, you be whatever you want. Whatever weight you want it to be, whatever, that's fine with us. We don't care. <laughs> it was like that kind of stuff. So I mean, now I'm like 145, which I think is a good weight for me. Because uh, you lose a little bit of why it's a good weight. If I was like, uh, like 20, the best weight would, for me would be like 165. What? But actually, like every decade, you lose Two to two to three percent of body mass, so you should be muscle. Muscle is like a huge amount of your weight, especially with men. So you know, as you get older, you should get you know you should weigh less because you don't want your waistline to be getting bigger. <laughs> it's like you know, the, the waistline is supposed to stay the same, and but your weight is not supposed to get bigger. So for your waistline to stay the same. It means you're waiting as to be going down. So that's how I got into it. And then about when I was like, after I had this practice going on for like two or three years, 2019. Uh, oh, no. So so that's how I got into it. And now it's going on for like January 2016. And I'm figuring this is so incredible. If this, if I continue after one year, and I'm still like, you know, extraordinarily impressed with the results. Everything is going good. No side effects. I will like unretire and start a very, 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 very small practice. The practice was aimed at the idea of basically people who were fellow travelers, people who had like read the same sort of like papers I had came to the same conclusions, decided they wanted to sort of like take rapamycin, but didn't have any access to it. There was, in other words, if I, when I decided I wanted to take it, I could just write a description walk into the local drugstore. Most people can't do that. So they didn't have any access to it and they didn't know the right way to take it because there was nothing in the literature that sort of like suggested the right way to take it. I just figured out the right way to take it. Uh, so I just wanted to have like a little practice and I figured I would see one or two people a month. <laughs> that, was, that was perfectly fine for me. That was like, I did like two patients, one or two patients a month. That's, that was good. It's just so I just like modified a part of my like, the, you know, house. I, I made the living room be like a double for a living room and a consultation room. You know, all I needed to do is add a table and a couple of chairs and added a couple of like panels. And now I had a consultation room. And I had, it was lucky, like I had a, a little room adjoining that, which made a very convenient, you know, like a little examination room. So without any, with that little, very little money, very little effort, no increase in no overhead. I was able to turn my house or a portion of my house into a medical office, but still have the same room available. And like, in other words, the living room was still there. I still live in the living room. I just, I have a table and chairs and a TV and like, you know, it's the same room. I just be able to do consulting. Anyway, so, uh, but then a couple of years later, in 2019, 
So now, like three years into this, uh, three years from the time I started, I started to practice in 2017. Now, two years into this, I have this here, an echocardiogram. And the echocardiogram, I find out that my total amazement, I wasn't suffering from aging at all. It's a totally like bog wrong, totally wrong diagnosis. I is like not suffering from aging. I had a very rare inherited cardiomyopathy and called apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, something like one in fifty thousand people. That's what I had. And then I realized in retrospect, wow. That's why there was nobody on my mother's side of the family. <laughs> that's what killed my mother. That's what killed her mother. That's, and that's what killed a whole bunch of the men on that side of the family. Because, I mean, the family was so completely different. It was like mother family, like you know, everybody was being wiped out by some mysterious thing. And on my father's side of the family, everybody was living a very long life. So, uh, and I realized that's what it was. That had been that was what had been stalking the family for like generations that nobody knew about. This apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which only presents in like middle age. Up until then, it doesn't present with any symptoms at all. But basically, but those people would have generally died of strokes because the number one thing it causes is it starts off by causing atrial fibrillation. And back in those days, they didn't have a good treatment for AFib with the anticoagulants. So they were dying of strokes secondary to AFib before they even got to develop the complications of the heart disease. So that's how I got into it, basically by accident. Now, by the time I realized that I was, that I, I was then very much aware of all the extraordinary benefits of rapamycin and how well I was doing asides from the heart thing and how well all my patients were doing. Maybe at that time, probably had 500 patients and they were just, it was, by then it had become very, very, very clear that these people were doing very, very nicely. And uh, um... Now, now you have uh, probably the biggest uh, clinical experience uh, regarding prescribing rapamycin. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I, I have a little over twelve hundred patients, and I've been following people for up to sort of like you know like six years. So I have a, a like enormous uh, you know experience. Uh, but it's going to become much much more widespread because Matt Cable just did an extraordinarily fine study. I've seen the results, can't talk about the results because it hasn't been published yet, but he's going to like very soon publish the results and the results show that rapamycin basically overall, it doesn't cause side effects. The only side effect, the only side effect, the only side effect there was, was the increase in stomatitis, which was Real common, everybody knew that, and that's but that's only in sort of like the first sort of like you know occasional. Th that's like a trivial thing. And the stomatitis is like also called canker sores. It's pinpoint little sores that pop up in your mouth. They're like if you blink, you might miss it. They're like two or three millimeters in size. They're like painful, uh, and they sort of like clear up by themselves. But they're very very sporadic. People have them. They're like Maybe 25% 20, of people get them the first three to six, three months or a few weeks, but almost nobody gets them after they've taken that mycin for over six months. It's just uh, like something when people just started. I think I had a couple when I first started. I haven't had any right now. So that, that was a trivial problem. That was the only thing that showed up on the sort of like all of the huge questionnaire. And the other thing that showed up, which was not statistically significant, but it's like real. It was like basically a double incidence of upper respiratory infections. It's like because that's that's the one that's the one real side effect, the one real side effect of rapamycin. But it's not a side effect. 
it's part of the effect. Like the effect is the major sort of like therapeutic effect is to reduce the activity of what's called your innate immune system. Now there's two different people get this. This is very confusing because there's two different immune systems. When, pe when people think of the immune system, they think of what's called the acquired immune system, but the acquired immune system is really what people think of as like T cells and B cells. That's like the smart immune system. That's what people, when people say the immune system or immune disease or autoimmune disease, they're thinking of that disease. They're always thinking, when someone says an autoimmune disease, they're always thinking of the acquired immune system and they're always thinking of disease, you know, driven by like T cells in which your body, because that's a disease that targets specific things. That's where it's like it's just a T cell targets a specific sort of like part of your body causing a particular disease. Usually it's confused. It's a case of mistaken identity. <laughs> in other words, you have had some sort of a infection that made antibodies against that component of the infection. And now it realizes that there's some tissue in your body that cross reacts with it. So it's like it's like you know, like mistaken identity is the autoimmune diseases, I would say, for the most part. But the, they're not intentionally talking their own body. It's like they've just made antibodies that cross react with it. And that was the original strep throat. That was the classical thing. People who have a strep infection, they have antibodies against strep, and now the antibodies against strep would cause heart disease and kidney disease. It was coarse reacting with the tissues in the heart and the tissue to kidney, causing like, you know, the male nephritis related to having a strep infection. That was like the, the classic first, very, very well described autoimmune disease. And type 1 diabetes was a classic like autoimmune disease. People would have a viral infection. Then the next thing that happens, they have like type 1 diabetes and they're wiping out their kidney. In the beta cells. So that's what people think of, like, that's the, like, what people think of as the immune system. Now, the, the, the innate immune system is totally different. It's a system that just goes by pattern recognition. It, it's not specific for anything. It doesn't sort of, like, you don't develop, you know, specific things more, you don't, like, increase your resistance to it. It's, the resistance is always the same. It's like, uh, and it's basically the first real, uh, uh, I would say, immune system that the body had. It was to fight bacterial infections. So it's a system which, which in that any sort of like protein or like thing that works that smells funny, it doesn't work like a real natural part of the body, they think it's foreign. It's like, your dog walking on the street, walking down the street, and he sees somebody carrying an umbrella and <laughs> like something like that or a cane, and he barks at that person and said, they don't look right to the dog. And like that's the that's the innate immune system. Things don't look right to them and they start barking. But their idea of barking is a chronic inflammation. And they sort of like say they start and and that turns out to be an extraordinarily common thing in age-related diseases in aging, because we also we wind up with all sorts of like altered proteins, and altered proteins are stimulating chronic inflammation. So anyway, that's the but this system, the innate immune system, it stops chronic inflammation, but it's your first line of defense against bacterial infections and fungal infections. Therefore, you have increased risk of getting those two things. The bacterial infections are like more common, but like the fungal infections can happen too, like a skin thing. Uh, and but fortunately, those things are very easy to treat, especially the sooner you treat them, the better the results. So I basically caution all my patients and that. This is like, this is the one risk you have. The one risk you have is the risk of infection. 
that's part of the sort of like treatment. That's the inevitable part of the treatment because we're talking in the innate immune system. So if any of you have anything that's suspicious for an infection, immediately takes it to mycin. And if you take, it turns out, if the cytomycin is an extraordinarily safe drug, almost no one has any side effects, like allergic reactions to it, side effects. And basically, if you like, take two cytomycin tablets, an hour later, and one hour later, you have a blood level, Two hours later, you're better. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you know, thought you're coming down with me, and you take two zithromycin towers, and you're better before you go to sleep that night. <laughs> and so, and you know, if you wait till you, if you wait till you have a high temperature, and you're coughing and so forth and so on, then you've had the infection for sort of like three days, four days, five days. It's a well entrenched infection. That's bad. The time, to, the time to treat it is in the first hour. When you have the first sort of like inkling, maybe I'm coming down. I feel like I'm coming down with something. It's like, and people have that feeling, you know, like, uh, you know, and if it's so, I mean, and you can generally, people can tell if it's like a cold, because it's like, it's not, you know, it's just runny really nose and sneezing. So if it's not just sneezing, it's something else that you take, you can, like, but the best way to tell is just if you suspect anything, Take two cytomycin tablets and you're better in a couple of hours and then and then you don't have to you don't have to continue the whole path. In other words, you only have to take it like until as soon as you're better, then you're better. There's no reason to continue. Continuing is just asking to mess up your bacterial flora. So taking it for sort of the shortest amount of time to take antibiotics is the better the way I see it. Uh, do do we know why? Some people uh, get the infection and uh, others don't uh, because it's it's not that common uh, with the uh, bacterial infection and things like that. So. Oh, you know, it's like uh, ten percent, and the whole question here, you know, like ten percent were reporting infections and five percent not on that mice were reporting infections. Like some people, some people just have a more robust sort of like system, so like it doesn't sort of like matter. In other words, it's only having a slight decrease in the sort of like you know, it's having a significant decrease, but not enough of a decrease to cause an infection most of the time in most people. But maybe so, it's maybe it's like how sort of like robust the the system is, and also how much they're coming in contact with like bad germs. Yeah, you know, things like that. And how is it? Um, if you look, if we look at your uh, clinical uh, experience in the area, that uh, is it. Uh, um, does it work a little bit uh, the same way as uh, mouth uh, sores? That uh, it's uh, it's the risk for side effects are uh, high in the beginning, but after. Uh, one year or something like that, you, the infections are not uh, that high? The risk of infection is always the same. It's always staying the same. The, only, the mouth and the things is sort of like your body, like this, it's like, that's like different. It's like, it's like, I always say what's going on with that is there's a clone of stem cells that are submissive and, are, and like not making like, cell, like the cells so you have a little like 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 two millimeter area that didn't didn't have the mucosa to like like replace it got replaced. But after a little while, those sort of like bad clones probably get removed. Now they're not there, and now you sort of like so, and now everything is like good, and now you sort of like just not having any problem. But it's basically, I would say, it's basically like the mouth sores is like. Radiation poisoning, only one thousand is the bad. Now, the, like the cells that proliferate and make that and radiation poisoning, this is happening like 10,000 times greater. You're not, in other words, all the sort of like the cells that replace mucosa, they're not replacing the mucosa, the lining of your intestines and mouth and so forth. So, you know, that's what, you know, so it's like, you know, one thousand, one ten thousand. So, Radiation poison type of disease, but it, but but it's just highly specific because it's just pinpoint little spots. It's like you know the whole like mouth 
99.99% of it's doing belly, and there's one little spot that's having a problem. Um, is there um, some uh, some other ways to uh, how the side effects uh, can be minimized? For example, uh, um, I, I'm I'm thinking of uh, the general uh, side effects. If we, for example, take rapamycin during the morning on empty stomach or no, no, something no. This else. Is just, this is just the normal effect. It's not like a bad side effect. It's the normal effect. You de- I mean, you're trying to decrease the innate immune system and, a, and part of decreasing the innate immune system gives you a slightly increased risk. I mean, the innate, this whole sort of system that rapamycin is, I mean, you can figure, but basically, is set it to way, way too high a level. It's like your body is sort of like acting like any day it might get mauled by a tiger and it got mauled by a tiger and it survived. It wanted to be able to like regenerate tissue and fight infections at the highest level possible. So the system is set like that. The system is set like, you know, it's a world in there which there's no antibiotics. Your body has to repair itself. And your body is in like it's like to like high level of getting all sorts of traumatic injuries by sort of like encounters with wild animals. And so it's sort of like set on a very, very high level. Well, that high level is sort of like good for them. It's too high a level for us, especially when we're getting older. We don't need it set at that high a level. It's like much better to wrap it down sort of like a whole bunch. How, how do you see about this uh, strategic uh, with uh, easing up the dose or uh, starting uh, target dose uh, directly? I know you, uh, in, most, in most patients, you use the start target dose uh, directly, if I have uh, uh, Basically, the only reason I saw like a lower dose is some people might be especially sensitive. So, uh, but after you sort of like see somebody who's not especially sensitive, then you sort of like basically have like a target dose. And I like to have like, uh, but it basically is empirical. In other words, uh, in order to have like a real scientific knowledge of what you're doing, you'd have to measure like peak levels and trough levels and like see how fast somebody metabolizes it. And then adjusting it to sort of like whether a fast metabolizes or slow metabolizes. I also like that those tests aren't readily available. I basically just like, you know, uh, figure an average sort of like dose is like six milligrams once a week uh, uh, for like men, like, you know, younger men, if they sort of like don't have any issues, like, you know, four milligrams, like, you know, some women, if they're like small, like 120 pounds. No issues, I you know two milligrams once a week. People with more serious issues increasing the dose. So if you have a, if you have something that you sort of like really targeting, you can increase the dose to like eight and so forth. Like you know, but basically, it's not. It's not I don't think it has the dose has to be rocket science. I think just a, the general sort of like effect of like reducing, uh, and to a, has a real good effect. And um, if we uh, go uh, look at the mouth uh, sores thing there, um, I'm uh, using rapamycin uh, today. I'm uh, on uh, uh, five milligrams uh, weekly. And um, I think it was uh, two weeks ago, I got a very, very mild uh, mouth uh, sore. Oh, yeah, that's, that's typical. Five milligrams. Uh, uh, I would say five milligrams is sort of like a, I would probably have started you on four milligrams because you look young and fit. Uh, but you know, like five milligrams, like, you know, that, that's okay. You know, like the mouth sore is like you just, you just started. Uh, you can see they're like small, like small and trivial, they clear up. And it's not likely that you're going to get any more. In other words, I mean, in other words, if you sort of like we're getting them frequently, you could de- decrease the dose to four milligrams once a week for a period of like for the first three months, and then you can go back on like five or if you want to be on five. But it's sort of like so people can simply like 
reduce the dose. It's, like it's dose related. So simply take a smaller dose. If this are, if it becomes if it becomes a frequent problem and the sores are getting bad and they're sort of like inside your lip and they're sort of like painful and so forth. If it becomes something that's sort of like a, you know a, a, more than just well, I have the funny little sore in my mouth. And it clears up. If it's coming to coming more than that. You can just decrease the dose, uh, especially if you were healthy and were didn't have a particular thing you were treating. And then you can figure after like you know three months, six months, you can go back to whatever dose you wanted to, and you're not going to have it. So the, so for the most part, they're they're the most common problem, but it's a trivial kind of a problem. And transplant patients, it's a very, very serious problem because transplant patients are at a high continuous dose, which makes them more likely to get that. And transplant patients can never stop and give the thing a chance to clear up. They, they can never stop or they'll go into a rejection. So there's nothing they can do about the sores until they're trying to be like treat them or some like topical steroids or things like that. But so the, for them, it's for them it's a very it's a it's definitely a, a major problem for transplant patients. Does there exist any special um, time uh, when it's not recommended to take uh, rapamycin, uh, like uh, uh, before a surgery or uh, something like that? The time that's not take, recommended to take rapamycin is when you're young and want to be growing fast muscles. So like taking rapamycin for like teenagers would be catastrophic. It's, instead of developing all this sort of like, 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 you know, the muscles you develop, it would be blocking all that. It'd be like, you know, catastrophic for like, you know, you know for people like young growing people, you know, like especially people going through puberty, rapamycin would be absolutely catastrophic. Uh, now, for like adults, the time you want to start to stop taking it is when you want to have when you want to have a high mTOR effect. The high mTOR effect would be any time you want it to be sort of like having a high level of healing, for making new blood vessels, making new fibrous tissue, healing anything that was a result of say like not like a wound or an operation, or You'd want to sort of like, and you'd want to have your M2 at highest levels because you want to have your innate immune system at the highest levels for fighting a bacterial infection. So if you were going to have like uh, think something like uh, a joint replacement, in which you have, in which you a high level, a high risk of infection because of putting the operation, putting it upon the body, in which infection is catastrophic. No, you stop rapamycin a good two weeks before. Now, by two weeks before that, you'll be okay. Now, you can stop, continue it. You won't continue it for a good three weeks later. You know, you have a good, like, you know, over a month window between, you know, before and after, you know, something like that. If it was a sort of, like, more trivial operation, like some, like, you know, uh, a minor kind of thing, and maybe like, one week before, one week after. But it's definitely sort of, like, Stop it anytime you want your know, sort of like your ability to like fight infections and make new tissues and feel fast to be at the highest level possible. That's when you stop it. Right? So for like that. And uh, what age uh, do you think is the best time to start uh, taking uh, rapamycin? Well, I think, I think. I think aging is starting at 40, and, and I think I think aging is starting basically 35. But by 40, it's becoming significant enough that you can start rapamycin. And, and there's a couple of things that are suggesting aging starting at 40. One, I saw this thing they did epigenetic studies. And the epigenetic studies they did it on all the sort of like different vertebrates and so forth, and they could tell exactly when they were supposed to like age and die. And it turned out for like humans, it was around 30 seconds. <laughs> well, and that, but it turns out with humans, 
they just start then, but they have to figure out a way to like drag it out. And I think at one time they were at one time that was really indicating their death. They were dying at 40 of old age. That was that's when they were dying. Now they sort of like genetically changed that. They, but they didn't change the epigenetic part of it. The aging program kind of like is still starting at the same age, but it's just, it's clearly not as intense as it was because people are now living to like an average age of 78 older, uh, as opposed to four. I mean, people used to have the same age age of like like you know chimps and things like that. It was funny. That's that was when they were dying. They were having, you know, this was this was kind of like about probably a hundred thousand years ago. Uh, Do you see any benefit in having those differences between, uh, for example, uh, a forty-year-old who starts and uh, uh, elderly uh, person? I increase the dose with each decade, with the idea that younger people need a lot less level of inhibition than older people. So basically, basically the dose is sort of like like based on like like yes, based on men needing more than women, older people needing less than younger people, people who are sick needing less than people who are healthy, people who are insulin resistant needing a whole lot more than people who are insulin sensitive. So it's basically just empirical guess. But the, the, but the qualitative aspects is because of the person. I think they need more, and, and I'm guessing about like so. I mean, for I mean, for my situation, I take 12 milligrams once a week, which is like the maximum anybody ever takes. And people want to take any more than that. Some people like spinning up to like you know increasing the sort of like you know every two weeks, but I would say 12 milligrams once a week, less the maximum dose. Uh, but the, the thing is, if people wanted to have, there's another drug called Temsurimus. Temsurimus, like, tem, I'm not pronouncing it right. That's, pronouncing a, it. that's an mTOR inhibitor also. Yeah, right. I, I'm, I'm pronouncing it just the way it's spelled. <laughs> you know, maybe it's like tem, tem, to Temsumalis or something like that. But anyway, I just sort of like pronounce it so way I can spell it. Anyway, what that that drug is, it's a it's been approved as a, a drug for metastatic cancer. It treats a whole lot of metastatic cancer. It's given IV and it's a it's a serolimus or it's a rapalog prodrug. In other words, it turns into, it's converted into regular rapamycin or serolimus once it's in the body. It's just AIS, but it's just a prodrug that adds something so it would be like, you say you could use it as an IV and do it. Anyway, it turns out they may use 25 milligrams once a week injections. And that drug costs maybe like, Five thousand dollars for like you know a couple months. It, it turns out that if you add grapefruit juice to rapamycin, you get the same can get the same blood levels on twenty five because you grapefruit juice increases the blood levels like threefold. Turns out that if you get take twenty five milligrams once a week, if, and you had like eight ounce glass of grapefruit juice every day with it, you wouldn't be having a 25 milligram level. You'd be having something closer to a 90 milligram level. You know, it'd be like that, but it'd be like, it'd be effective sort of like the anti-cancer effect. But I don't sort of like use that. It's that that's just like an anti-cancer effect, but it shows that you can, you because uh, you wouldn't want to take more than a certain amount. And, but then if, if you want a higher amount, you can manipulate that way. But that's sort of like, you know, getting into like way more side effects when having you know, like levels like that. But 
So the, the basic idea for your question is four milligrams is a good dose for women and six milligrams is a good sorry dose for men. And once and once a week, I don't see I don't see any reason to like take it and stop and so forth. So I don't see any reason for that. But for people who want to take it a higher dose and take it once every two weeks, you can do that. Like you can take 20 milligrams once every two weeks, but I don't like taking it like that. You touch a little bit that uh, there are also other ways of uh, inhibiting uh, mTOR. Can you talk a little bit uh, more about that? Uh... Oh yeah, you can. You don't have to take rapamycin. You can just do a forty percent caloric restriction diet, <laughs> and 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 a forty percent caloric restriction diet, you'll get the same, pretty much the same effect. Because you have it, like on forty percent. Like caloric restriction, you start getting like serious nutrition issues. I mean, you can do ten percent caloric restriction daily, right? You know, continuously all the time, and that's real healthy. And maybe you can do fifteen percent caloric restriction, but forty percent caloric restriction, that's definitely sort of like getting into sort of like nutritional issues and hormonal issues, probably also. What Hor hormonal issues probably uh, yeah, also? They'll have all sorts of stuff like well, the hormonal issues I would think relate to zero percent body fat. <laughs> you know, that's the only sort of like you know, the hormones on. But that's gonna cause the same but in in, in now studies forty percent caloric restriction gave an equivalent effect of sort of like the like the the rapamycin. Uh, and so, like they, that was very much an equivalent effect. And how is it with um, uh, protein restriction and things like that? What's your What's your view on that? Because that some people see that also as a way of inhibiting mTOR. It's not mTOR. The protein restrict, like caloric restriction. This is sort of like it's similar to, to rapamycin. Caloric restriction and rapamycin are similar. They're inhibiting mTOR. Protein restriction is about inhibiting methionine. Methionine is sort of like a very, very special amino acid. And methionine turns out to have a very good. I mean, they had my living, rats living 25, 40% longer on with, with iron uh, restricted. Restriction turns out to be a little good. It's a totally different pathway. It's a pathway, it's a very, very different pathway. It's a pathway involving glutathione, mitochondrial. It's, part, it's very much involved in the glutathione, mitochondria, electron transport, that whole system, that is sort of like it's that system, that's an important system. And I like the thyroid restricted diet as an adjunct to rapamycin. I, it's like, I think it's a very good like adjunct because it's a totally different pathway. Rapamycin sort of like actually hits on that pathway. It's, it's, it's money where it has like very many, many effects. It hits on the mitochondria, but not, but just very small. Nothing like what, what a methionine restricted diet is. So, a protein restricted diet is a methionine restricted diet, and a methionine restricted diet is basically a vegan diet. It, it's again, exactly like a vegan diet, very, 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 very few, like a couple of different things, like there's a couple, but it's basically, that's what it is. It's 98% a vegan diet. And but um, right now in the United States, a whole lot of people are becoming like vegans. The problem is, they're all young people. <laughs> they're all young people who don't necessarily need the medical benefit is like uh, maybe it's 2% of 
of all the people and 10% the other people. So, uh, but it's definitely sort of like has a benefit and it's a very, very you know, important benefit. But <clears throat> I think of it as an adjunct to replication, not a sort of like, uh, and, but an adjunct that should be extremely, extremely helpful because since it has a different pathway, it should be very synergistic. Yeah, very, very interesting. Um, if we look at uh, uh, your uh, patient uh, pool there, um, what would you say is the typical patient uh, that gets the best uh, result of uh, taking rapamycin? There's two different kinds of patients. There's the healthy patients and the not healthy patients. The healthy patients are the people who are like, Insulin sensitive, that is looking real fit, that is not overweight, that insulin sensitivity score is real good, and they're basically real healthy. Those people are doing spectacular. Those people are like, you know, setting records in sort of like Junior Olympics and things like that. They're like, they're like doing extraordinary. I mean, what they're doing is like mind blowing because at the level of health, people in their like 70s are having who are like healthy and taking their medicine. Then there's the other group of people who is like not so healthy. There's like insulin resistant. They're sort of like they're still overweight. There's not able to become insulin sensitive. They're getting like a benefit, but there's probably getting half the benefit of like people who are like really fit. Very interesting. Well, what, what, what do you think it's uh, like? That? Is it because of the prevention uh, that uh, rapamycin gives, or what? Uh... It's, it's it's slowing down aging. It's simply slowing. It's like it's like slowing down aging and it's slowing down all the age related diseases. So, but it's like a couple of kind of like those two things are kind of like a little bit different. But it's like some, in some diseases, it's just stopping them. Like it's just it's just stopping coronary disease. Because coronary disease is like this is like just like the lipids get oxidized. They stimulate the sort of like innate immune system that causes the chronic. And so like you know coronary disease, it's initiated with like cholesterol fractions, right? But that's just the initiating part. The thing that drives the disease is chronic inflammation and the development of like senescent cells that are relevant to that. It's the chronic inflammation part. If you stop that, if you stop chronic inflammation, you just stop coronary disease. So it just stops coronary disease. It stops another disease like gingivitis, which is like similar. And like gingivitis is the same sort of like thing in that. Oh, I have to let this go on one second. No, no problem. Anyway, so like gingivitis is a very indication of what's going on. Gingivitis is bacteria are causing the breakdown of stuff, causing foreign chemicals. The bacteria is not invasive. It's not an invasive infection. But the bacteria breaking down the chemicals, they start the inflammation. Now the inflammation is breaking down your gums and breaking down the underlying bone and resulting in losing your teeth is the most severe example of uh, like advancement of like gingivitis. Rapamycin stops that. People in people on rapamycin, they don't get gingivitis. They don't get gingivitis. They don't get coronary heart disease. Two things that sort of like, uh, uh, like you know, some people like so, so forth. Uh, what will you say is the most common question you get about uh, rapamycin? Where can I get it and how much does it cost? <laughs> and uh, what's the answer to that? Yeah, uh, the best place you can get it turns out to be Little Night George Store. And it's like it cost about two dollars and ninety cents a milligram. Although the best place you can get it. But insurance pays for it, 
but insurance pays for it just dramatically. I think they're paying for it because they don't know, they didn't investigate what they're paying for. And I just mean, well, if someone has a prescription, but it's still a prescription. They don't expect it, they don't, they don't, they just make the assumption that this is like a thing that they would treat. If they thought, no, this is to prevent aging, they would say, we're not treating it, we're not paying for the prevention of aging, that's crazy. You know, that, that way, but so <clears throat> insurance pays for it just because the insurance pays for it. And they don't investigate it. But if you have to pay out of pocket, you don't have to look to it. It's like the best place to get it. It's like the parallel you know, block to me, and they was like, looked into a, how they could get, some, get a very good preparation at a very good price. But if you, otherwise, the best place to get it is just with a good OX coupon. With a good OX coupon, it's around $5 for one milligram at the standard sort of like CBS and so forth. And uh, what would you say is the most uh, common misconception uh, among uh, other physicians uh, regarding uh, rapamycin? Well, everything related to transplant medicine. In other words, transplant medicine, <clears throat> It was approved to be an immune suppressant and suppressing the cervical, as I said, the acquired T cell function. So it's sort of being an immune suppressant. And a million people have used it in that way, over a million people. And all the side effects are related to that. Everything in the PDR is related to that. Everything in the, everything in the literature is related to the effects of rapamycin as used as an immunosuppressant in transplant medicine. Now, that's because in that situation, it's suppressing mTOR2. And so like and using an anti-age once a week. So you're using it once a week, you're just suppressing mTOR1. When you're using it daily, you're suppressing mTOR2. There's a whole different sort of like set of side effects. And suppressing mTOR2 causes very serious side effects. The people on serolite take it in transplant medicine don't have any extension of lifespan uh, whatsoever because the effects of serolite, so they're suppressing mTOR1 and mTOR2. The harmful effects of suppressing mTOR2 overshadow any benefits of suppressing mTOR1. So that's the sort of like thing. The sort of like the, the most major thing is to confuse the effects of taking rapamycin once a, a week with the effects of taking it every day. It would be basically like the same effects of sort of like alcohol. If you sort of like drink alcohol every day, it has a very different effect than if you drink it once a week, especially in high doses. In other words, you can get totally wasted with alcohol <clears throat> once a week. <laughs> but every day, it's going to have a lot more different like, side effects. And also, al alcohol is involved in the same system. Alcohol is, in other words, how the alcohol is like being used is sort of just the center of but in addition to that, it's having an effect, like it, it has a side effect. In other words, like the main effect of alcohol is just a sort of like, you know, like depressing of your sort of like brain, so you sort of like feel better and so forth, so happy and whatever. That's, that's like the normal effect that people like expect. That's that's the effect. The side effect of alcohol is it, it, it's like its effect on mTOR1 and mTOR2. And the chronic and the effect of chronic alcohol is to like reduce mTOR2 and also be toxic. That's like so it's so it's getting it's, it's involved, but it turns out alcohol is getting involved in the same mTOR system. And that's why people who are drinking just like a little bit of alcohol, like a couple, they're ha they're doing better. Like they're having better health, like they're having this peculiar better health results, like you know. You know, than people that's between ketones 
when people drink a little bit of alcohol, the little bit of alcohol people are having bad effects. But chronic alcohol people are still having bad effects. So it's and that's simple. It's like it is basically sim similar to like mTOR one and mTOR two. A little bit of alcohol is reducing is reducing mTOR one, and a whole bunch of chronic alcohol is reducing mTOR two, and also a combination of reducing mTOR two plus getting toxic to the liver. That's so, so like that's what's like causing the problem. But it's part it's like it's part of like it's like the side effect of alcohol is gets involved in the whole <laughs> mTOR system. Well, that was a really great uh, comparison there, uh, Alan. If you are uh, new to the rapamycin topic and uh, start to look at uh, the uh, science, um, then you see, for example, in mice uh, studies, uh, they take high daily doses of rapamycin. Why? Why can a mice take highly daily doses and live long, but not? a human okay so so the mice is like very different than humans but now and the mice studies they can do two different types of mice studies they can do mice studies in which they give serolimus as an injection when they give us an injection that's to get the side that's to replicate the side effects of transplant patients and see that they're getting no high doses when the sort of like when the mice are taking it orally, it doesn't matter what dose they're taking. They don't have much absorption and they have a very fast metabolism. So because they don't have much absorption and they have a very fast metabolism, it acts to primarily reduce M21 in the mice. So the mice is, is basically the mice, but the mice are just metabolizing it so fast that it's like Take it once a week for a human because even though they're taking it every day, they're just metabolizing it real fast. Then they're getting up to real high levels. Do you do you think we will uh, see similar uh, life uh, span effects in humans uh, as in uh, mice? Humans are going to have much better effects. The thing about the sort of like mice, ninety percent of the mice die of cancer. Rapamycin, so like, uh, and so what you're seeing on my, on the mice is basically just an anti-cancer effect. Uh, I mean, you're having a little bit of an effect, but I would say almost like the entire effect you're seeing, like if they're, if they're living 25% longer, they're all, 90% of them are dying of cancer. They're just dying of cancer 25% less. So you basically see in mice, you're seeing an anti-cancer effect. Rapamycin is not very good as an anti-cancer drug. It's just a little bit helpful. It's a much, much better drug for the age-related diseases that humans get. So humans can expect a much, much better effect on this sort of like health span than anything you're seeing in mice. Because human, because in humans, it's treating a whole it's treating in other words, it's treating coronary preventing coronary disease. The mice aren't getting that. And humans is preventing dementia. The mice aren't getting that. Uh, and humans is preventing sort of like uh is helping as people but so forth can be increasing on insulin sensitivity. The mice are getting that. The mice are sort of like you know, if the mice are just treating cancer, uh I mean it has a little bit of an anti-aging effect on the mice because you can see on the mice who didn't get cancer, they're showing the effect. And you can see in the small number of mice who don't get cancer, that they're having a beneficial and a real anti-aging effect, but they're not contributing very much to the statistics. You know, they're just that they are, are occasional and like occasion, this mice didn't get cancer, this mice had like very nice anti-aging effects they may be running around while you're doing other stuff like that and things like that, that kind of stuff uh and it'd be like you're living a whole bunch longer but the actual statistics are going to be <clears throat> overwhelmingly die dominated by the 90 percent dying of cancer 
So, uh, and and it, and when they came out with the sort of like you know, like uh, my studies, somebody sort of like I think his name was like Nepp, uh, and he sort of like is a German, and he like wrote a paper. He said this isn't an anti-aging effect; it's an anti-cancer effect. And basically, like other people say, no, no, it's real anti-aging. Well, it's an anti-aging effect and that they were seeing that. But the thing, but what was dominating the statistics, but he was right, what was dominating the statistics is the anti-cancer effect. So, so I think that that means humans are going to do, expect to do a whole lot better as regarding improvement of health span than the mice are doing because the humans are like, you know, instead of having a small anti-cancer effect, but they're mostly dying of other stuff. They are like tons of other stuff they're dying from. But then the, the problem is people run into other sort of like, there's just like, there's a lot of sort of like programs to limit lifespan. I, I, I think the number one program involved to limit lifespan is telomeres, like shortening telomeres. It's not, it's not how short your telomeres, it's the rate of shortening. The mice have a very, very the mice have like a hundred times faster shortening than like humans. And that gives them this huge like vulnerability to cancer. But anyway, the animals that live a long time, like the tortoise, you know, like certain fish that live a hundred years, they don't have shortening of telomeres. Any animal that has shortening of telomeres as they get older, that's going to sort of like place the ceiling on their maximum lifespan. So basically, I would say humans can stay healthy for like into the 90s or maybe to 100. But at a certain point like that, they're going to run into the ceiling of telomeres and they can't break. And without having that, the, you know, changing that requires a, a total change in the in how the body's like, you know, I think, that's not available now and doesn't seem to be so like so that's so that the shortly telling is is that I would say a ceiling as soon as people start getting into the late nineties or hundreds. How do you do you do you think uh, rapamycin will be FDA approved uh, in the future uh, for longevity use? Well, it is FDA approved. And usually once the drug is sort of like, so the question is, would the FDA expand the label to use it? You know, the FDA is not going to expand the label because first of all, the fundamental thing about like, and like that, that, is that the whole world of medicine believes is that aging isn't sort of like a thing, it's like the disease. They're not sort of like recognizing it as, so, so forth. So they're not recognizing it's sort of like a disease that can be treated. The FDA's sort of point of view is we treat diseases, we license drugs to treat diseases. We don't treat natural conditions. This is a natural sort of like thing. So since this is a natural thing, we're not going to license the drug to treat it. And even if they change the whole philosophy, the whole philosophy and they 100% understood what was causing aging. And say, well, it's, well, it's a program thing. That's sort of, you know, if they can still say, yeah, but it's still natural. It's not. It's not a, a disease. In other words, the classic concept of a disease comes from the Romans, and it's sort of like true. A disease is something that somebody gets. If everybody gets the same thing, that's not a disease. That's a natural thing. So the FDA can like. Because of like absolutely always say, aging is a normal thing. That's what's programmed to be. That's how your body is programmed to work. It's programmed to sort of like, and then it's like so that's a natural thing. That's how the body is programmed to work. We're not sort of like uh, licensing any drug to change the basic sort of like program. That'd be to be like the idea of that. Growth hormone. Okay, so they have licensed growth hormone to treat what would be a pathologic condition 
children who don't have enough growth hormone and are not grown to a normal size. It, it slices the cheap bad. Suppose she said, no, I want to use it differently. I want to be like seven foot four because <laughs> I want to be on the MBA. The MBA is not going to approve growth hormone to be used so you can go to be seven foot four and have a good career in the MBA. They're not going to like it's like, well, that's no, it's like, that'd be good. That's not, that's not, you know, growing beyond your like normal height. It's like that's totally different than treating a disease of somebody who has not grown to the normal height. So the idea is to like the FDA could definitely say having rapamycin increased lifespan beyond its normal sort of like levels and beyond what was like the normal it was a normal program to do isn't treating a disease. That could in other words, that could cause them to have a very strong objection to that. And there's also it could have catastrophic implications for the health of the financial people can say, well, like the government is saying, we have all these entitlements. All our entitlements are based on people living at their calculated age, 78 is your average age you're supposed to be. We don't want people living to 90. And that doesn't, that, that was like just, you know, even if we went to sort of like 78 to 82, to 82 to two, four years, that would be enough to sort of like cause absolute havoc, you know, like a nuclear meltdown of the financial system. They certainly don't want people living 15 more years. They don't want people living into their mid 90s. Medical profession can say, we have a trillion dollar industry. This idea of people not getting sick doesn't look like a good idea to us. <laughs> um, uh, it's a complicated area, you can uh, say. So, so, anyway, so other people could argue, well, these people would be all the people, would, they'd be more productive. You would you'd be saving money on sort of like all the medical expenses. They'd be more productive people. Uh, but the balance of people are going to go down is like, no, we don't need any more old people anyway to look at it. <laughs> so, so from that point of view, it's not getting approved by the FDA anytime soon to sort of, you know, the aging. Very, very interesting. Do, do you have any future projects ongoing, Alan? Future projects that I'm working on? Uh, yeah, my future project is working on my book about sort of like how aging works and how sort of like an, 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 an anti-aging program. Oh, nice. When uh, when do you pa uh, plan to publish uh, that book? Yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question. <laughs> step by step. <laughs> I, I, re you know, I revise the preface every day and I come up with some other chapters. But so I come it along and maybe if I... If I finished it by the end of the spring or the beginning of the summer, that, if I finished it by July 1st, that would be a great accomplishment. Because aside from like writing the book, I'm also not giving up my day job. <laughs> so I have a full-time practice seeing patients. I'm like writing the stuff on my like, weekends and a couple of days I schedule to have off. And uh, for those uh, people who are interested in uh, what uh, Alan has uh, uh, written, I can uh, highly recommend the, his homepage. Uh, I will uh, add the link in the description so that you can uh, find it easy. Uh, I think uh, uh, on the homepage uh, there are also contact information how to get in hold of uh, Alan. Um, do, do you take uh, do you take new uh, patients? Uh... I'm very very happy to see new patients. The only special thing about my practice is I don't have to do any staff. It's just me. I don't do telephone calls. The whole practice is based on emails. I like people sending emails. I respond to emails. That's how I like. That's how it goes. 
emails are sort of like, you know, like everyone, but I'm definitely taking new sort of like patients. And it's interesting to point out new patients. I really want to point out and say that the number one best thing that rapamycin is for is people who are APOE4 positive, especially people who have two genes. Two to 25% of people have one gene for APOE4. Those 25% get the great majority of cases of dementia prior to age 80. For people, there's two and three percent of the population that has two genes for APOE4. And for that, it's catastrophic for those people. They can be developing dementia in their late 60s, early 70s. And they have a very high incidence. Rapamycin is like spectacular for E4 people. I have like a good 500 E4 people. Nobody is showing any cognitive decline. I've got 60 double E4 people. They're not showing cognitive decline. I think rapamycin is very, very good for e is people who are E4 carriers. I would say they're the number one target or number one so sort of like people of like the whole group. I mean, everybody, if you're like human, you're going to be getting old, you can be taking that license. But more than anything else, it's like those people should be taking that license. And everybody should know, basically, uh, the APOE4 type. Well, if you had, it had four grandparents and they were all 85 years old, and you got to interview them when they were all 85 years old, and you were, and after a long interview, she decided they're very cognitively intact. Then you can decide, I'm not E4 positive. <laughs> I talked to all four of my grandparents. But if all, if you don't get the, and you probably have to do it yourself because the people like generally you don't, you don't get a good history. You know, maybe someone, maybe when someone has, but has some dementia and nobody talked about it. So it's probably you probably need to interview all four of your grandparents. But if you did, and you can reassure yourself they're all good, then you're good. However, if you don't have that, it's a good idea to get a genetic test. Now, a genetic test is real cheap. It's $79 in a place called Empower DX. They turn around the result in every one week. Everybody should know. That's one thing that everyone should know. Everybody should know. The two things that everyone should know is APOE type, a genetic test. And the other thing that everyone should know is the insulin level, because insulin is the core thing for insulin sensitivity. And the fast the insulin level, when you look at it with combined with glucose and hemoglobin, you see, you see exactly how you're doing. People, you want to be insulin sensitive, not insulin resistant. And in order to sort of see that, it's insulin. So everybody should have like their insulin level. That's the test that they can, they can get. And everyone should know APOE4 level. Whether they're APOE4, they just reassure themselves, okay, I don't have that. I can cause Alzheimer's disease off my list of things to worry about. Should, should they, uh, those people uh, start to uh, rapamycin uh, uh, around uh, 40 also? Or? That by 40 is sort of like good. They can start it, but they can definitely start it. And they can start it if they were 30. But they can certainly, if you were E4 positive, you, know, you ideally you would start it at age 30. If you are one E4 gene, you would start it at like 40 would be fine. So one, 40 would be fine for one E4. Like 35, 30 would be good for two E4s. But, but they're basically, as long as you're starting before you're having any cognitive decline, you're doing like real well. It's just important to like know that. But 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 the, and it turns out the brain is the number one beneficiary of lowering mTOR and rapamycin. The brain is the like you know, far and away the organ that benefits the most, uh, and and good forty percent of people on the questionnaire they were saying. Yeah, they were thinking better, but I think it's much more than that. I think, like in other words, I think like most when I talk to most of my patients, 
most of them. Most of them you talk to, it turns out their brain is working better. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, uh, Dr. Alan Green, uh, it has been a really great uh, conversation, uh, this. And uh, uh, I must also um, wish you a happy birthday today. It's your uh, eight years uh, uh, day today. So, uh... yeah, I, I, I'm very, very happy. Like uh, eight years ago, I did not definitely did not think I was going to make it to this. So I'm like very, very happy to be here and 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 to be feeling like twenty, feeling like very, very nice shape. You know, like that's amazing. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Alan, and uh, take care now. We should do this once uh, more in the future and uh, see when more research and uh, more knowledge uh, increase in the field. Very good. The, the major paper coming out is Matt Cable and study. That's going to be a great paper. That's a questionnaire of like, you know, like 360 patients, almost all my patients, I like they responded. And he got a very, very good, you know, like, you know, he had tons and tons and tons of questions. He got a very good and now like picture of what people are saying from the questionnaire. That's great. That will uh, give a quite good summary then uh, of what you have talked about here. So really, really good. Yeah, I thought that the, his paper is a very, very good paper. I looked at the results. Everything was consistent with exactly what I, my impression was. My impression was maybe a little bit better because you know because I talk to people more than you know, uh, but the results gave you a very good picture of what was going on. Great, yeah. Thank you, Alan. Very, very good question. Uh, very nice talking to you. Disclaimer: the podcast is for general information and uh, educational purposes only and is not medical advice for you or others. The use of information and other things linked to the podcast is at the user's own risk. Always consult your physician with anything you do regarding your health or medical conditions.